We started by talking about just a couple high-level principles in software security. You know, right now I'm thinking we're going to have beer as soon as possible. That's what I'm thinking. So this is not going to be a long talk. And this is really to introduce you to OAuth and where your research should go when you want to learn about OAuth security. This is actually a very difficult protocol, and a lot of people use it incorrectly. So I want to talk about what OAuth is, why we're supposed to be using it, what the proper use is, the different scenarios for use, and look at some security considerations, and then point you to the different threat models that are published. In 2013, there was the OAuth 2.0 threat model published. And since from 2013 to today, there's been a whole series of different standards that are being published to address more security-specific areas in OAuth, like authentication, OIDC, OpenIDC Connect, or you adding cryptography back into OAuth 2, and so on. So if you already know OAuth well, this is going to be review. This is a, a talk for those who are, are new to OAuth. Hi, my name is Jim. And you know, a key uh, before I get too much further, you're going to see my company at the bottom here. O OWASP does not endorse any commercial company, including my own. So I'm just taking one of my professional decks and just using it, and I'll open source it and make a Creative Commons and take my name off it. But this is not. This is just one of my commercial decks. O OWASP does not endorse any commercial company, including my own. So we're going to talk about OAuth. We'll look at uh, issues around cross site request forgery in OAuth. We'll look at redirection endpoint security issues. We'll look at tokens and the security around tokens in general. And we'll talk about different grant types. So let's start by what OAuth is. So what should OAuth not be used for, right? It shouldn't be used for traditional access control. You're not going to replace role-based access control or a capability access control system with OAuth. That's not what it's for. It's, OAuth is not authentication. You're not going to replace your login mechanism with OAuth. That's not the point of it. And you're not going to replace OAuth. You're not going to use OAuth for federation either. What I mean by federation is things like SAML, where you're delegating authentication to a different party. That's not the point of OAuth either. And yet people use OAuth for all of these purposes which leads to a variety of security problems, right? So what is OAuth? Anybody want to tell me? What's OAuth smart guy in the front with his Bitcoin locks and all that? What, do you, what, what's, what, what is OAuth? It's hard to describe it. On whose behalf? Now you're talking. I'm going to take data from one API and use it in another API on behalf of my users. So that's the, and what's that called in? Authorization. It's not authorization, not technically. It's called delegation. And what does the standard say? The standard calls it authorization. It's part of the authorization family. But when you have an OAuth token by itself, what can you do with it? I can authenticate with it and then give, get access to certain limited features as well. So it's not, it's, it, the point I'm trying to make is, would you swap out your access control system, your authorization system with OAuth? No. You would not. So that's why I get nervous when people say OAuth is just authorization. So let's, let's get into it. What is it? And this is what Twitter says. Twitter says OAuth is an authentication protocol. They're wrong, but Twitter's often wrong. They're just Twitter, right? OAuth is authentication protocol that allows users to approve applications to act on their behalf without sharing the password. The key here is act on their behalf. And here's a, a better academic answer. Well, no, sorry, here, here's a better explanation. We'll get to the academic in a second. OAuth is like a valet key. You know what a valet key is? First of all, I drive an old Honda. My laptop is worth more than my car. That's just how I am. And so a valet key is a kind of key if you have a nice car. Like, what's an example of a nice car? Not some garbage BMW. Boo. Mercedes. Boo. I'm talking like a Ferrari. I'm talking like an Italian car, like a Ferrari. That's the only real nice car out there, correct? Right? Ferraris? Okay. I'm, I'm Sicilian. I'm supposed to say that. American cars? They're junk. No, don't go American cars. What's, what was that? 
Honda. I, I, I drive a Honda, too. But suppose I actually had taste, which I don't. I'm working on it. And I had a nice Ferrari. When you purchase a Ferrari, you get two kinds of keys. You get the owner key, which will, open, which will start the car, um, open the glove box, and, and open the trunk, right? That's where I keep the bodies, right? So you also get a valet key. That. What's that? Uh, they're small. I, all right, I, I agree. Depends on the model. But if you get a valet key, what is the valet key? You give it to the valet, he can start the car, but he can't get into the glove box and he can't get into the trunk. It's a limited access key. And this key has both authentication, I can still start the car, and authorization built in. I have access to one feature within that car. And so... Um, it provides another domain, delegated access to your application server resources. And so there's two versions of this protocol, one and two. And so the, one of the main founders of OAuth, it's not Aaron Hammer, was the first person to jump in and build the initial standard OAuth 1.0. And he was the he wasn't the original guy. There's a few other people from Google who started OAuth uh, and, and from Twitter who started OAuth. But Aaron really took it over and led the standard body to build this published framework. And so the problem is when OAuth went from one to two, Aaron Hammer did something called rage quitting. What does it mean to rage quit something on the internet? Yeah, it's not just politely like an adult leaving and saying, I'm moving on to other things. He had to publish a blog that said why he was so full of rage and why the world was wrong from his point of view, and he had to quit with style, so whatever. But the point, the reason why he got so upset during this process, <coughs> OAuth 1 as a delegation framework, it's not a protocol, it's not a standard, it's a framework. It's, it's the OAuth 2 framework they made the shift away from digital signatures to something called a bearer token. This change made OAuth radically less secure, but much, much easier to do. So this is a very interesting thing. Back in November 2006, we got Blaine Cook working on OAuth while at Twitter because everybody wanted to tweet on different users' behalf. For example, suppose I have my website. Um, Jim's pasta website. And what I want to do is every time someone submits a new pasta recipe that I approve, I'm going to tweet on their behalf after I approve it, my pasta was approved at Jim's pasta website. Now, so look at the, the workflow. The user logs into Jim's pasta website, a dot com, a dot i, dot i n, whatever, and, uh, and, and then they, they submit their recipe and then they log out. My review, I only review pasta recipes on the weekend when I'm done with my work. And I want to tweet on the user's behalf, but they're not logged in anymore. So what am I going to do? How am I going to tweet on a user's behalf when they're not logged in? They can give me their Twitter password credentials. Now, who here is, would you want to give your Twitter credentials to jimsapastawebsite.com? No, you don't. But that's what they use. But that's what they used to do, though, right? And so the, the, the OAuth is going to solve that problem. We'll talk about it in just a moment. 2007, Magnolia, Google, and others join the discussion and begin forming a real publishable document. Aaron Hammer joins, leads the specification, and drives the OAuth 1.0 final draft in 2007. At this time, the standard is all about digital signatures. Every individual client, another server, is given a certificate <coughs> who then signs, the, signs every message that's verified at the, at the server level, the Twitter server level. Um, the, the problem is, how difficult is it to work with digital signatures? Not that difficult, but how difficult is it to work with digital signatures across 10 different programming languages in a, combati in a compatible fashion? That's a huge problem that's not even solved today, but that's the problem we saw at OAuth 1.0, dealing with compatible digital signatures across every single web programming ecosystem. It was taking a long time to get all of this stuff working, and the same problem was happening over and over again for every new OAuth 1 specification. 
So around this time, Google began their OAuth 1 support, and Twitter started their support and forced it just a few years later. But we're at this era where we're having all these horrible problems supporting digital signatures across a multi-programming language web ecosystem. So around 2011 and 12, the OAuth 2.0 body begins, and they're pushing the, the framework away from cryptography to something called a bearer token. What's a bearer token? A bearer token, so a, a digital signature request, it's tied to the owner of that request. By itself, it's no good. It's like if, a, um, it's a, if someone steals it, they can replay it, but they can't create their own messages. The message by itself is not valuable. Uh, where a bearer token, it's just like an ID inside of it. A bearer token in and of itself is all the attacker needs to authenticate and get access to this protected resources. With digital signatures, they need the private key to sign their own messages and so on. And so while the standard was weakened by all these enterprises coming into the standard, it was way easier to use. And if you're, twi if you're Google, you got a lot of PhDs, right? Around, so if you're Google, you could just throw 20 PhDs at your OWASP server and build it very securely. Most other smaller companies don't have that luxury. So, ar so around uh, 2012, OAuth 2 was published. And around uh, 2013, a very famous document called the OAuth 2 Threat Model was also published to guide developers towards building secure OAuth client and server-side solutions. And this threat model was bigger than the standard itself. So again, we're in OAuth 2, we're depending upon TLS to be correct. Because if I can look at the message, that's all I need to copy it. I can change it, give myself other access, it's game over. So TLS across all of OAuth 2 is critical. How easy is it to build a TLS API that's world class and cannot be harmed? It's actually a very difficult problem. Again, you want to use forward secrecy ciphers, you want to use a proper version of HTTPS, you want to make sure you're constantly updating OpenSSL and you're turning off renegotiation and, and, this, and getting strict transport security in play and making sure all your user agents support it. It's actually complex to do it really right. OAuth 1, again, was just sig digital signature based. And so we have bare tokens versus digital signatures, ease of use versus good security. <coughs> so which one should we be using? And the answer here is we should be, if we're starting over from scratch today, if we're building a new authorization server, if you want your resources shared to other websites, then you want to use OAuth 2.0 today. The only service that's really using OAuth 1 is Twitter and a few others. Google rolled away from it back in 2012 completely. And the, the reason why I would suggest OAuth 2 as a starting place today is because the ecosystem with it is very mature. There's a lot of people talking about and building OAuth 2 solutions. We've seen OAuth 2 out for several years, and there's not been any major incidents. All the major OAuth 2 um, authorization servers and resource servers have been built fairly strongly, and we have good examples of that in the world today. And uh, if you really want to bring back the crypto, and you should be bringing back the crypto, there are several OAuth 2.0 add-ons that let you do this. Again, keep in mind OAuth 2 is a framework. It's not a standard. Everybody who builds their own OAuth server to share in their resources, they're all going to be a little bit different. You don't just build one library that supports every server. Google, Twitter, Facebook, Fitbit, all of their OAuth 2 servers are a little bit different, right? So let's talk about, again, why we use OAuth. Let's talk about Fitbit for a second. So, uh, you know, someone told me if you get Fitbit, you'll lose weight. And I tried it. I haven't lost weight because you have to exercise with it, too. I didn't know that part until recently. <laughs> so I'm going to try that now. But suppose I want to have a Jim's Pasta websites. Not only will you put your pasta recipe, we'll put your, pit, we'll put your Fitbit data up there as well so we can make sure that he's not eating too much of pasta. So be careful about that, right? So we'll track the Fitbit with the recipes they're submitting. Now, how do I collect Fitbit data on behalf of my user? 
We can have the user give me their Fitbit credentials, but that's very weak. So what we'll do is we'll build an OAuth2 server at Fitbit.com. And then Jim's Apostle website, he wants to use Fitbit data. So how does this work? First, uh, Jim's Apostle website has to register with Fitbit server. Make sure I'm not just saying this. Yeah, there we go. There's OAuth1. There's two. So first of all, the Fitbit, the, the uh, Jim's Pasta website needs to register with Fitbit. The standard doesn't even define this, but they say, good luck in registering, make it secure. Why do we do that? And the standard says, I don't know, good luck. So that's up to us to figure out. So the, the Pasta website registers with Fitbit. Fitbit gives a client ID back to uh, uh, Jim's Pasta website, and now we have our initial registration done. Now Martin, who's, Martin, you're Italian, right? You're German, I know you're German, right. But didn't the Germans invent pasta, though? That was a, <laughs> close enough, close enough, right. So you want to log into Jim's, uh, Jim's Pasta website and submit a recipe, so you do that. You log into the website, submit a recipe, great. Then I say, hey, Martin, for a bonus point, why don't you register with Fitbit as well? And you're like, let's do it. So you say, let's register with Fitbit. Now, using the client ID of Jim's Pasta website, you're going to get redirected over to Fitbit and be triggered to log into Fitbit on behalf of, your, on behalf of Jim's Pasta website. So you log into Fitbit, and Fitbit says, would you like to give your Fitbit data to Jim's Pasta website? You log in and say yes, and then you're redirected back to, uh, to Jim's Pasta website. You give them an, a, an authorization code, which they then give server to server from, from Jim's Pasta website to Fitbit. Fitbit now, back and forth, server to server, can exchange Fitbit data on your behalf even while you're not logged in. Again, it's not access control. It's not authentication. It's delegating certain features on behalf of you to another party. And this is the basic workflow that describes how this is done. Now, in practice, we look at OAuth implementation of the last couple of years. There's not a lot of major incidents showing this gone bad. When we have seen problems, individual accounts were popped, the issue was fixed, and we move on. So although this protocol is, def although this framework is very weak in describing how to build its security, in practice, we just haven't seen a lot of major events, and I thought we would. This is the open source vulnerability database from uh, uh, Jericho, and these are, the, these are all the OAuth hits we've seen just in the last couple of years, and they're not major, to be honest with you. So again, back, let, me do, let me explain this workflow just one more time. Um, your e-commerce server, okay, okay, we want to use OAuth to get some e-commerce server to tweet on behalf of the user even when they're not logged on. So the user logs into the e-commerce server, Jim's Pasta website, he gives them the account, he edits his account profile, and then the e-commerce server redirects the user to Twitter. Twitter will say, you're about to log into Twitter and give permission on behalf of your account over at Jim's Pasta website, you finish logging into Twitter, you get redirected back to the Pasta website with the proper code. That website, site to site, will send the code over to Twitter. Twitter will say no problem, and then provide tweets and other data and access to tweet on that user's behalf. Yes, Martin. How's the intensity? So that's a good question, because you're often, when you go through this workflow, you're often given a token called a refresh token which is permanent, it lasts forever, and will always let you get a new access token. The way you're supposed to expire most OAuth workflows with the, with the authorization code grant type that I'm describing is that the user has to cancel it. If you have, if anybody, have you used, um, have you given your Twitter account access to other websites before? Have you gone through that workflow? So when you do that, if you go log into your Twitter profile, You'll see, you'll, there's a link that says third-party apps, and you'll see, oh, Jim's Pasta website, the iPhone Twitter application, the Twitter thick client application for OS X, and, uh, uh, you know, schnitzel.com, whatever other sites you've done this. And you could just go and say, oh, Jim's Pasta website, cancel, boom, auto-revoked. It's up to the user. It's up to you as a programmer to make this clear. It's up to the user to revoke 
most of these refresh tokens because it's, it's user controlled delegation in most situations, right? So go log into Facebook, go log into Twitter, look at your account profile, and you'll see all the third party apps connected. When I first uh, was studying OAuth a few years back, I'm like, I wonder, I went to my Twitter account and said, listen, I had like 30 different apps tied to it. Now, I just didn't even, I, w I was just playing with it just to experiment with it, I wasn't even keeping track of it. And revoke, 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 done. So that it's up to the user in most workflows. So let's talk. Let's look at a couple high-level concepts. Please, 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 go ahead. Oh, as a user? Oh yeah. I mean, be be careful when you do this. You have to trust that party. Now, what you can do as a user? Suppose all of a sudden Jim's pasta website says something profane like Italians didn't actually invent pasta. This is not true. Italians invented pasta. My mom told me that. My mom, are you telling me my mom was wrong about where pasta came from? Yeah, people, the Chinese invented pasta. I've heard people discuss that in Wikipedia and most major academics who know anything about history. But my mama said it came from Italy, so she's right. Okay. Where were we? I'm sorry, I got lost. Where were we? Oh, yes. Okay, so Jim's, suppose Jim's pasta website starts, so you've already authorized a tweet in your behalf, and Jim's pasta website starts saying some crazy things. What you do is you go to your Twitter account, go to the user profile, list third-party apps, there's Jim's pasta's website, revoke, then Twitter feed, delete, 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 done. That's what you do. Remember, this delegation is not controlled by Twitter. The delegation's controlled by you, and whenever you want to revoke that relationship, click, done. That's the answer. Cool? Yeah. So let's look at a couple high-level concepts in OAuth. We have roles. The, the, how are we on time, Martin? Let me just check real quick. Uh, within 45 we're, good. We're, we're good. We're good. Let's look at a couple of high-level concepts in OAuth. First of all, there's the resource owner, the user in this case. There's the resource server. That'd be Twitter in this case. And then there's the uh, client application, Jim's Pasta website, some fly-by-night site or some other partner, and then authorization server. So very in OAuth 2, the way you deliver resources and the way you authorize requests have been split out so you can do better, uh, better enterprise class OAuth. But it's, it's the same, re same server. So then you have different grant types. First of all, there's the authorization code grant type. This is very similar to OAuth 1. That's when the actual access token is never in the hands of the user. So I go to, I'm getting redirected to Twitter. Twitter redirects me back to my site with, it, with one code that the server uses between Twitter and the server only to send the actual access token to provide the actual resource. And so that's the main grant type, authorization code. One of the reasons OAuth 2 is so important is because they have other workflows for things like a native app or a mobile app that OAuth 1 didn't do well. So you have the implicit workflow. So I want you to think for a sec. I know this is a little bit boring for some of you. I see a, the, a lot of yawns, late in the day and a lot of yawns. It's OK. But let's think through this for a second. With the authorization code grant type, the token is good forever, usually, and it's exchanged server to server. With the but you have to give this power to the application. There's another grant type new to OAuth 2. That's called the implicit workflow. What that means is when I log into like Jim's Pasta website, it's going to deliver. And first of all, step one, I have to log into Twitter. Step, step two, I have to log into Jim's Pasta website, which delivers some JavaScript to me, which will read the access token out of JavaScript that Twitter placed there and let me make a submission to Twitter. And in that workflow, I'm never giving the access token to Jim's Pasta website. I'm just staging it up on my website, in my web page, so some JavaScript from Jim's Pasta website can read that token in a predictable place and make a request on my behalf only when I'm actually logged into Twitter itself. We, use, we, we see this, this workflow with PayPal a lot, where I come into your e-commerce site the e-commerce site wants to pay via PayPal. I get redirected to PayPal, give them my credentials. 
Then I go back to, then I go back to the actual e-commerce page, which triggers a transaction, and then you're logged, the PayPal is logged out of, and I just let another site PayPal on my behalf without actually being logged, without actually giving that power to the website itself. I kind of chewed that a bit, but that's fair enough. Why would we do that? Why would we use the implicit grant type? What's the point of that? Exactly. What, 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 what are some business reasons to do that? Are we, what, what, do we, what do we gain and what do we lose? We lose the ability for a client application to act on our behalf when we're not logged in. Exactly. What do we gain, though? It's a one-time transaction, better security. We're no longer giving the keys of the kingdom to this client, Jim's Pasta website. That's probably some clinically insane Sicilian running that website, right? Like my son, right? Exactly. It's, look, it's negative usability, better security. And, it's, and we're, we're, I see a lot in e-commerce workflows. A couple other terms. You got the resource. That's just the user, the, the resource owner. You'll see this when you read the specification, which is going to be your homework tonight. You have the resource server and the service provider. And those, that's really the uh, yeah, resource server. That's the portion of your server delivering the actual data. You have the authorization server. That's the portion of your server that's uh, the uh, authorizing and authenticating different kinds of tokens. Then you have the client. That, that's either a web server, a thick client, like a trusted client, like your Facebook app or your Twitter app on your phone, or it could be a native application, like the native Twitter app that you have on your operating on your on OS X. And so here's other terms you'll see when you read the standard, which I recommend you do. An access token. That's a token you give to a resource server which gives you the, that access immediately. A refresh token is something that one of your clients holds on to long term to request a new access token. A client identifier, when you have server to server communication, each one of the servers that registers with your, with your OAuth server, you need to give them a different client ID. In some cases, I've seen groups use the same client ID for everyone. That, then you lose the ability to revoke entire servers. For example, suppose you're Twitter, and all of a sudden, Jim has passed a website. Jim has been getting a little drunk at night, and he's been, he's been changing his server code to tweet some really crazy things late night on behalf of every user in his system tweeting crazy things like pasta really came from Hawaii when he, after he had a few to drink. Not that I would ever do this under my identity, but um, that's a problem. And Twitter's been analyzed. Twitter's like, all right, Jim's pasta website, we gotta, he needs to sleep with the fishes. So now Twitter revokes that client ID for Jim's pasta website, shutting down the whole website's ability to use OWASP with Twitter. That's why you give a different client ID to every server. Here's another use of OWASP, though. This is called the, pass, uh, the uh, password. Let's go look that up real quick. The other workflow is the um, resource owner password credential grant type or workflow. In this case, it's like you're downloading the Twitter app onto your machine. You log in and give it a token. So uh, when you have a thick client application, every client gets its own ID. Because a client authorizing to Twitter doesn't actually provide any access. It's the user logging into the Twitter client who gets an access token. That's the real authentication. So for a thick client, it's, you don't need to worry about a different client ID for every client. Yes, sir. So that's, that, that's not a user-specific OAuth workflow. That's you want to use the client credential grant type for that. Not authorization code, not implicit, but this is, there's a fourth workflow specific to OAuth to handle uh, OAuth relationships not specific to any user, just to look up generic data on that site. So you'd use the client credential OAuth grant type and look at that in the threat model. It describes how to deal with that specific workflow. That was part of 
That's not your question, though. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Of course, you can cache it. Um, again, the actual OAuth framework does not describe that level of implementation. That's up to you. It, it, and for any kind of for any kind of um, high availability system, you want to do some kind of caching of different of diff different kind of credential verification. So I tend to not store those tokens as actual tokens. I'll use an adaptive hash or some one-way function to store them adaptive hash, so I'm not actually storing the actual tokens if, if I can get away with it. Yeah, o o o OIDC is an authenticated federated standard built on top of 2.0. That's a whole different. That's a whole different presentation, which will start at ten. Right? I'm just kidding, everyone. So I'm. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not listening well. T tell me your question one more time. Yeah, that's that, that, that's a uh, yeah. That, that's less of a security question about OAuth and more of a generic implementation detail for any high availability system. Of course you can do caching. That's a whole different conversation of how to cache security credentials for verification safely and stuff, but of course you can do it. And for high availability stuff, it's not that you can, you have to do it. You have to minimize database hits. They're some of the most expensive hits out there. So I can even do things like predict what users will be logging in at a certain point of time and begin caching their stuff in a predictive way. There's a lot of different strategies for that. A after some beer, well, no, no, so I, I, have to, I have to leave at the hour, but I I'll happily give you my email address. We can talk about that offline, but that's a fair question. Other, so other, to to and that's great. You give me a chance to talk about this. You know, client credential, again, that's when your server wants to retrieve data not on behalf of a user, just generic data. So where was I? Uh, I'm going to skip bear token for now. So here's just a, a little glimpse of security in OAuth. Look, we're, we're finishing up. I'm going to finish up a little bit early here. I can see the fatigue, everyone. Your homework is to go read the OAuth 2.0 RFC. And it's a pain to read these, but it's really going to help you understand this more than a one-hour presentation. And even better, in 2013, members of the OAuth 2 team published a very well-written threat model that describes all these different scenarios of use and scenarios of engineering. You're an authorization server builder. You're a client implementer. You're dealing with a token registration or a registration system. They broke down all the risks against OAuth by uh, by a variety of different categories and explained how to deal with it very well. That's your homework, those of you who want to learn about OAuth security. It's again probably one of the best threat model RFCs I've seen to date. So here's a, a glimpse of that. Number one, use TLS for everything when using OAuth. No choice. Number two, authorization servers should not automatically process repeat authorizations to public clients unless the clients validate it using a pre-registered redirect URI. So as when you first register, you register what redirect back to the, you, back to the main client is needed. And if anyone ever gives you a different URL to redirect, you know it's going to be a bad client or someone who's not using the framework properly. Also, authorization servers can mitigate the risks with automatic processing by limiting the scope of access tokens. Everywhere in the threat model, the main thing that comes up is whenever you're providing scope, that's how much access this token gets, which principle governs how you give scope to a client application or a client, sir, a client application? It's principle of least privilege. We see a lot of folks who are just making the scope basically the whole user account and giving, o, giving OAuth delegated clients access to like account management features and similar. Um, and also, look at this fourth bullet. You need to explain the scope to the user really well. So when I go to my Twitter account and I say list 
uh, third-party apps, or if I'm at my Twitter account and I'm being redirected to log in on behalf of Jim's pasta server, you have to explain to the user clearly what they're giving up or what access they're providing. And so as part of good implementers, we have to describe these steps well so when the user says, yes, I'm giving you this power, they know clearly what they're, giving, what they're getting into. Narrow the scope, narrow the scope. Be careful what URL you let redirect. We already mentioned all these grant types. Let's do it one more time. Almost done, folks. So, uh, so number one, you can hide a refresh token or a long-lived token from the user and only send it server to server. That's the, that's the main grant type that really is the whole protocol, honestly, authorization code grant. Most of us building OAuth servers are going to use this grant type. Number two, for like temporary one-off transactions, I'm, I'm going to steal that. I like that. That's a, a good way to describe this. For short-lived tokens and like one-off transactions, we have the implicit grant type for like that PayPal scenario. Number three, you could also grant and expose a long-lived token to the trusted client. Like if I have a third-party Twitter app or Twitter's native app or, or uh, we download the Facebook app, they're almost all using OAuth 2.0 and the, the password grant type for a trusted client. The client by itself can do nothing. A user has to log in through that client to do anything. <clears throat> and like you were asking about, you can grant and expose a long-lived token to services that need access to data not associated with a specific account. That's client credential grant type. So that's another reason why this, this work, why OAuth 2 is so much better than 1. Even with the weakness from lacking, that lacks cryptography out of the box, we have all these various workflows to describe modern situations in web and web service programming today. So... Here's the, the uh, here's the a graphic of the workflow from the standard itself. I'm just going to move on here. Um, we talk, the, again. I'm going to mention this briefly. The code grant authorization code grant. That's the server to server hide the token. Um, I'm going to jump in here. How, how much we have? Like five minutes, right? The the rest of this presentation is going to point to the different grant types and the different the different the different. Um, the, this is describing the authorization code grant workflow, the most important one, and it's pointing to the risk, mo the threat model that describes everything developers need to do to build this securely. It's several pages. I highly recommend you read this. I'm running out of time. My apologies. And a few big risks that will pop up when you read the threat model is CSR, CSRF attacks against OAuth. One was a big issue. You want to use a state parameter just like a CSRF token. Um, the other big things that will pop up are... Um, open uh, different redirect attacks. OAuth works all by redirecting, right? I'm at the pasta site. I redirect to Twitter. It redirects me back to the pasta website. So in one of the variables you'll send in different OAuth requests is going to be the redirect URL. So when you're setting up a registration system, when a client registers with your Twitter or whatever your resource server is, at registration time, they should give you the redirect URL that's ever given to you again or your validation of the URL is bad or, or you allow a more permissive URL or you let it be not even validated at all, you'll have different redirect and open redirector problems, right? If you're not validating that client ID well, then anyone can use your authorization server as an open redirector and cause problems. And so and if the access token is, this is one of, the, one of the reasons I don't like OAuth out of the box is that it's bare token based, and if someone steals your token from the database of the server, from the storage system of the client, or in transit, it's game over. It's one token to rule them all. That token by itself can usually be replayed or at least stolen and used. So some of the things you want to do is you got to make sure all these pieces are secure. The threat model covers this in great detail, and make sure these tokens are one-use tokens. You give me a refresh token, I give you an access token. You give me the access token, I give you access to that one request and invalidate the token. That's a viable model to, to minimize your risk as well. And so, holy crap, this is crazy. It really is. As an individual developer trying to build an OAuth authorization server, you have to go and read a 20-page threat model in detail and know what you're doing. One mistake and your whole system is violated. So really go read the OAuth 2 
and the OAuth 2 threat model RFCs. It's a good habit to get into in working on these protocols that are fairly young. It takes massive effort to build a secure OAuth 2 solution, unfortunately. Throw your best people at it. And this is a good principle for all of authentication. Suppose you're a developer and a mature enterprise, and you're working on the authentication mechanism. You better have a damn good reason to be doing that. That's just anyone you could throw at that. People working on your front gate authentication and OAuth and similar features, these need to be your best people who understand secure coding. Major providers like Google and Twitter, they got PhDs to spare. A little bit less at Twitter this week, but you, know, you can throw a lot of your top people at the problem and solve it. Smaller companies don't have this luxury. That's one of the problems we have. And clients are at risk because they're likely to build less secure implementations than the providers. So when you're building a client solution, you know, be aware that you really want to use as limited scope as possible so that when damage is done, it's minimal. <coughs> Among other defenses described in the OAuth threat model, and buckle up, read this stuff first before you get going. There's many, many recommendations you have to care about. It can be done, it has been done, and you're gonna, you're gonna be able to provide a kind of delegation that has only been available to us as programmers for a couple years. Hey, it's been a fun day, enjoy your beer. We're done, thank you so much everyone. But before we go to beer, any, quest any questions though? Please go ahead. It's something you would never use that for. OWASP's main use is to delegate resources to a different server, right? If I'm going to just log into your application and use it, you should probably use for access control either role-based access control, which I personally don't like, or capabilities access control. And then on a feature-by-feature -feature basis, you would tie that to an OWASP access token specific for that individual feature. So you're going to map, that's one of the issues, that's one of the, the issues of building an OWASP service. You have to map these individual limited scope tokens to specific features and permissions within your system. It's not something OWASP would address directly. Any other questions? I'm, I'm sorry, your question? Right, that, that's, that's not OAuth. That's usually OpenID Connect. Is, and, and I'm not even sure if it's that, actually. That, that's usually OpenID. And so when you're, yeah, log in on behalf of Facebook, that's not OpenID Connect, that's OpenID. But suppose, you're, um, suppose you want to use Atlassian, and they give you an option, sign, and you, you have Atlassian specific to your domain, and then they say, you can use your Google account to sign into your Atlassian account. And you have no choice but to do that. That's when like you set up like mycompany.atlassian.com and I'm gonna let only people from my domain log in and I'm using Google for apps. Well, I can use OID, OID Connect to connect my Google account domain specific to the Atlassian online service. Now I'm logging in on behalf, now I'm logging with my Google account to get into my Atlassian account for my company. That's OpenID Connect. OpenID, when you see that generic Facebook login all over the place, that's OpenID. That has nothing to do with this conversation. OpenIDC Connect is a layer on top of OAuth 2, though, an authentication layer on top of OID, on top of OAuth 2.0. Blah. What was your question? OK, <laughs> good. Any other questions? It is, what time is it, Martin? Time for? Time for beer. Time for beer. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>